sure of that. And Advent often, I'm going to give you just a little recap, but Advent often consists of the familiar and therefore predictable themes of hope, peace, love, and joy. And some preachers and churches who recognize the Advent season um, come at it with like a liturgical point of view, okay, or in a very structured manner, and they stick to those themes and, and things like that, while others sort of go off uh, the beaten path a little bit um, to highlight other aspects and insights of the season besides just those common four themes. And this year, that category fits me and therefore fits us. Um, and so it's kind of the Advent road less traveled that we are taking. Um, I mentioned last week that I find it important uh, to use these weeks leading up to Christmas as a way to hopefully build up emotion and build up suspense and build up excitement at the celebration of the coming of our Savior. And it's a day that for the Christian, they hold such meaning and significance in our lives, right? Uh, the day that the greatest gift ever was given to all of the world and the day that heaven came to dwell on the earth among mankind. But the word Advent, though, is not a Christmas word. <laughs> Instead, it simply means appearance or coming. And so its use by believers makes it a term that we use both for Christmas to talk about the birth of Christ, but also for his coming again. And so the purpose of our studies this week are both to prepare us for the celebration of the birth of Christ, but also to remind us, okay, because it's very good to be reminded of these things, to remind us that we are eagerly waiting or should be eagerly awaiting his return, okay, as well. And so to have within us like a longing um, that can't be satisfied with any other thing, but it's a longing for the day which has been promised to us by the promise keeper himself, right? He's not a promise maker. He's the promise keeper because he keeps every single one of his promises. And that promise is the day that Jesus will come to take us all to be with him. But until, amen, yeah. But until that day comes, okay, there is so much to do and so much to learn and so much to share, okay? And so it's with that in mind that I'm bringing you um, the more obscure themes this year of waiting, appearing, or not appearing, sorry, accepting, journeying, and birthing. Those are going to be our four themes, okay? So last week we began with waiting, um, and waiting was found all throughout the scriptures, and we saw that, okay, the waiting of Messiah. It was spoken by the prophets of the Old Testament. It was um, rehearsed on the lips of John the Baptist many times as he awaited the Messiah. He awaited his cousin. He awaited the one that he had been a forerunner for for so many years to actually start his ministry, right, for Jesus to start his ministry, um, that waiting was burning in the hearts of the disciples after Jesus ascended because soon is a very relative word, you know. So when Jesus would say, soon you'll be with me again, or soon this will happen, soon is very relative when you live eternally, right? And so they had this burning in their hearts that they couldn't wait to be reunited with him again. And I pray that we have that same burning in our hearts as well. Okay, that, that, ha that longing that happens as we await that time. And as we wait to celebrate his birth, you know, we have, what, 18 days until Christmas, if anybody's counting. Um, and it's not just about the to-do lists, okay? But also waiting even more so for another Advent, the day of his coming to catch us all away. And so now we're going to begin into our second week with the title of the message tonight being Advent the season of accepting. And so just as the time of Christ's birth was a time of waiting, it was also a time of accepting. And I think this is going to be, um, hopefully to you guys, it was pretty neat to me as I began to unpack it all today. But as we go through tonight, we're going to look at examples of those who accepted God's will and God's plans for them. They accepted his will. They accepted his plans. And because of that, there was a great impact that was then made, not only in their own lives, because anytime we say yes to God for anything that he has moved on us to do, it's not only going to affect our own lives. 
And we're going to see that in Scripture tonight as well. It wasn't just for their own lives. It didn't just make an impact on their own lives, okay, but also the eternal impact that it's made on all of us. Can we think of Mary and say that her yes to God made an eternal impact all the way onto us this many years later? Yes, it did. Okay, how many times I'm reading scripture and, and I read about what it says about someone in the Bible and I'm like, they did not know that they were going to be written of in the Bible. They did not know that 2,000 years after they lived, we were all going to be reading about them. They have two sentences given to their name out of the 33,000 scriptures in the Bible. And this is what was said about them. And if your life had to be summed up in a book that would last for thousands of years and who men would give their lives for to transpose it into other languages and to give it into other countries, what would you want the two lines in the Bible to say about you? And what could they say about you right now? And if it's not something that you would want written, I had an aunt who years and years ago told me the best piece of advice I ever got was don't do anything you didn't want published on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And I thought, well, I don't know anybody that reads the Wall Street Journal, so I don't really care. <laughs> that was that part of my life that I was in at that time. <laughs> okay? But if you had something that was going to be written of you right now, what would it be? And if you don't like what you think someone would write about you, then guess what? As long as there's breath in your body, there's hope for your soul. And there is time to turn that around while time is still ticking. Amen? So... The impact that was made, not only on their lives as they accepted God's will for them, okay, but the impact that it made on all of us. And so in doing so, I pray that we will also see the key importance that there is in our following suit with each and every one of them, okay, to accept his son as our savior, to accept his forgiveness in its entirety, to accept his will above our own will, because those don't always line up with each other, right? Um, and to accept each plan and each call and each directive, whether we understand them or not. How many times do you not understand the things that God speaks to you or the things that he moves on you to do or the thing you want me to say what to who? I don't even know that person. And all he wants is our yes. He's got it all figured out. He has it all planned out. He already knows what's going to happen when we say yes to him. He already has all of that. That's not for us. It's not for us to understand. It's just for us to go, okay, I don't get it, and I might look like a fool, but that's okay. I'll look like a fool for Christ's sake. Amen? So, doing so, if we do that, it's not only going to bring glory to God. Yeah, it will. But it'll also bring the blessing of God and the purpose of God and the power of God up close and personal to you, up close and in your face to you, and not just to you, but in the lives of those who's your, who your life touches. So you've heard of the blessings of God. You've seen them on other people's lives for sure, even if not on your own. You've heard of the purposes of God being called out. Or you can see ones from history that the purpose of God was so distinct in their life. It was unmistakable. You could see it from the time that they began in any of it. And what about the power of God? Have you ever seen the power of God move through someone else? Did it only affect that person it was moving through? Absolutely not. When the power of God moves through you, it's actually not anything about you. It's about who's on the other end of your words or your actions or your hands or your food giveaway bag or your whatever. Okay? And so our first portion of scripture this evening is going to come from Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. I'm going to be reading this out of the New King James Version. See if it sounds familiar to you. Verse 26, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was, good job. Okay, Murray, not Murray, that's a guy's name. No. <laughs> Verse 28, and having come in, the angel said to her, 
Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Verse 29, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Like, what's he talking about, Willis? That's in our language, okay? (laughs) Verse 30, then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob, meaning over Jacob's descendants forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Verse 34, then Mary said to the angel, I love this, how can this be? since I know not a man. Other translations say, how can this be, since I am a virgin, right? Like, I know this much. I might be young, but I know this much. Like, how am I going to have a baby? 35, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy Spirit who is to be born will be, that Holy One, sorry, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was barren. Now, who was that that she's pregnant with? John the Baptist, okay? Verse 37, for with God, nothing will be impossible. The NIV there, I love it, says, for no word from God will ever fail. I love that. With God, nothing is impossible. No word from God will ever fail. Verse 30, 39, 38, sorry. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And the NIV there says, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. So first off, I want to say that I think we, um, especially those of us who have been at this for a while, we might forget that we are to marvel at these things as we read them. Sometimes it becomes so familiar to us. You know, we've heard it so many, yeah, 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 the virgin had a baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. Think about what you just said there, okay? We should marvel at these things. We read and we hear and we're familiarized with these things so much and, and with other things particular in Scripture also that sometimes we, we're left unaffected by them when we read them. Whereas the first time we heard it, we were like, say what? <laughs> yeah, that's impossible, right? And so after a while, we might, yeah, 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 I've read this before. And we become unaffected by just how miraculous or just how amazing or just how, like, blow my mind amazing these things are. And so first and foremost, this is a human being, Mary, right, going about her daily life and tasks that day. And suddenly there's this angel that appears, okay? I don't know if he was standing there, if he was hovering, if he was floating, if he was flapping his wings while he's talking to her. I don't know. But all of a sudden there's an angel right in front of her talking to her okay I was gonna ask some of you guys if you've ever had an angel talk to you and then I decided I don't want to hear about it if you did so (laughs) but we can read over that part especially that part okay so nonchalantly yeah 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 the angel appeared to Mary and said you favored of all women think about what just happened there Okay, think about it. Can you even imagine that happening? The next, according to the culture of the day, Mary is young here. Okay, she's a very young woman, most likely not even old enough to be considered a young woman in our day and age. Okay, she's young, um, especially by our standards of what we think of. Okay, she is a young maiden. She's not yet married. She's a virgin, right? And this angel speaks to her 
of these mind-blowing, unheard of, impossible things. Why do you think he had to say, with God, nothing is impossible. The word of God will never fail, right? And then notice also that there is no response from Mary that says, let me pray on that. She didn't say that. Let me wait on confirmation. I'll get back to you. Can you give me the weekend? I need this to, to discuss this with Joseph, the one that I'm betrothed to. Can I at least just sleep on it before I give you an answer? We don't see any of that here, do we? Yet what do we hear all the time? Oh, let me pray about it. Wait, I haven't received confirmation yet. Well, let me go talk to my husband first. Or the one that what I'm engaged to first. What were her words? They weren't that. We see only a heart and an attitude of surrender. Or as our Advent theme this week calls it, acceptance. Her words again, let it be to me according to your word. Or I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. That's it. So first, an angel is hovering or standing or floating or whatever, face-to-face -face speaking to you. Whoa. Then he has a message from God to you, okay, that you, a virgin, are going to become pregnant by being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, whatever that means. Whoa. And then he even tells you the gender of the baby and what you're supposed to name the baby. Whoa. Okay? Then, as if all of that weren't enough, he concludes it all by telling her of the miracle that her cousin Elizabeth, also being pregnant, even though she has been barren her entire life or infertile, okay, her entire life, and is up in her years, to put it politely, right? I got pregnant with Isaac. I had to go to special doctors. You know why? It was right there on my chart of advanced maternal age. I'm like, that's just rude. <laughs> First of all, I didn't even mean for this to happen. <laughs> Second of all, how are you going to write advanced maternal age on my chart? You think I don't have a hard enough time accepting this the way it is as I'm seeing the wrinkles and color in the gray and going, what do you mean I can't color my hair for 12 weeks? First 12 weeks I'm pregnant, i got to have gray roots coming in. What's up with this? Of advanced maternal age. Guess what? Elizabeth, if she had a chart at the specialist doctor for those of advanced maternal age, it would have said that on her chart also, okay, because she was up there in her years okay so yeah wendy wendy feels me on that one so <laughs> yeah i only did it once um somebody asked me the other day do you have children and i'm like yeah we have three they were born in three different decades <laughs> they're like what i'm like yep i had one in the 90s and one in the 2000s and one in the 2010s we just had three kids in three decades we spaced them all out so we never had to be an empty nester all the way until the lord takes us home they're like, okay. <laughs> but the importance here is that I don't want us to lose the, um, the mind-blowing, mind-boggling craziness of all of this just because it might be familiar to us, okay? But I also want us to see here, though, is that even in the midst of all of those whoa moments, have we ever had some whoa moments of our own with God? Okay, even in the midst of all these whoa moments, I want us to pay attention to Mary's response. Mary, through her words and through her attitude and through her demeanor, she shows complete surrender. She shows complete acceptance. It's important to note, and so I want to be sure that um, I differentiate this for you, um, God kind of pinpointed this to me today, is that what Mary demonstrated was acceptance, which is what we're talking about tonight, okay? Um, she demonstrated acceptance. She didn't de um, demonstrate resignation. And there's a difference between those two, and it's vital to see the difference here, okay? Acceptance, not resignation, because acceptance is different than resignation, okay? Acceptance is rooted in faith, and that's what's so important to know, okay? And knowing that God's ways and his thoughts and his plans are 
always greater and more purposeful than what our own does or are, are, okay? So acceptance is rooted in faith. Resignation is rooted in futility. And there's a huge difference between faith and futility, right? Okay? It's futile to fight it, so I'll just go ahead and resign myself to it. Okay? That's resignation. And so as if a, a decision or any action is pointless, it's unable to change anything that goes on, Okay, so one, acceptance, all right, holds out an expectation. And as it's holding out an expectation of what is going to happen and what has been spoken, it's also tethered to hope at the same time, okay? But resignation, on the other hand, dreads what is to come. There isn't this hope and this expectation of what's to come. Instead, there's dread that's attached to it. Okay, and it stands ready to be proven right, not to be proven wrong. Okay, I don't want to do this, but it's futile to even try to change it. But I already know what's going to happen, and I'm dreading it, and you just watch. I'll prove you right because it's how it's going to happen. See, I knew it. There was no use. This is what always happens. I had no choice. I knew it was going to happen. I just resigned myself to it. That's it. That's not what Mary did. Mary accepted what it was that the angel said to her, but she didn't just resign herself to that, okay? She didn't resign herself to the things that God was calling her to, all right? Mary was accepting to them, and there's a big, big difference there, and that difference was important for us to note. But another aspect to consider, this is just based on this section of Scripture that we've read from Luke, okay, is just who all had to submit to this plan, and I don't think we often think of that, okay? So God establishes it. God establishes the plan, but God doesn't make anyone do anything, right? And so let's think for a minute of Gabriel. I don't think we think of him very often, right? Yes, he's the messenger angel of God, but guess what? According to what we know of Lucifer, when Lucifer was one of the angels in heaven, he usurped his own will and his own agenda above that of the will of God and the agenda of God, right? So evidently then, we have to surmise from that that it's possible for angels to have a will of their own. We don't think of that. We don't talk of that. But guess what? Lucifer had a will of his own, and it didn't line up with God's will, right? So knowing this, this should make us marvel all the more. It makes me, I was sitting thinking about it today, it makes me marvel all the more that the angels in heaven worship 24-7, God. They worship him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It was and is to, is to come. 24-7, they bring their worship before God. And that is astounding to us if we think of the fact that they actually have a choice in all of it. But guess what? Being in the presence of supreme holiness of God and his grandeur and his magnificence and his majesty and his worthiness and his holiness, okay, it propels them to do no other thing but to worship him. And if we could just grasp what it is that the angels have obviously grasped, okay, of his worthiness, and of his grandeur, and of his majesty, then maybe we would all worship with a little more fervor. Maybe we would all worship a little bigger portion of our day and of our lives. Maybe we would do it all the more just like the angels do. In fact, I think we'd actually spend a lot more time on our face before him if we only caught a glimpse of what it is that they already see and what they already know. Amen? But specifically, for tonight's theme of accepting, okay, Advent, the season of accepting. And specifically in this case with Gabriel right here, he needed to accept and act upon what God was calling him to do. And that was to deliver a message of the soon coming king, of the soon coming Christ child to his soon to be mother. And it's a task that I'm sure he was actually thrilled to take on. But seeing the obvious ability that angels had to rebel against God, then we have to at least see that there was a choice 
And so this was an actual accepting of the task that was made by Gabriel, okay? Now, from there, we're going to go on to Mary. Do you think that God would have had the Holy Spirit overshadow her and impregnate her with the Messiah if she had refused to give her consent to the angel? No, absolutely not, right? You guys hear me say it often. God is a gentleman. He will not force himself upon anyone against their will, okay? And so whether that's for salvation, a calling, a gifting, an anointing, or even being the mother to the Savior of the world, okay? God will speak. He will woo. He will ask. He will draw us unto himself. He will lead us because he has a way set out for us to go, okay? But it is on us. It is on each and every one of us to answer that call and to follow that lead. He will never make us do that. It'd be so much easier sometimes, wouldn't it? God, why don't you just make me obey you? Why don't you just make me listen to you? Why don't you just make me do things the right way the first time instead of having to learn the hard way, which is my way to learn things a lot of times? Why don't you just make me do that? Wouldn't it be so much easier? But guess what? God didn't want a bunch of puppets. If he did, he would have made a bunch of puppets. But he didn't. He made a bunch of human beings in his likeness and in his image that he gave this beautiful gift of free will to. And so each and every one of us have a will to do whatever it is we want to do. And we can hear God and we can sense him drawing us and we can see him leading us and opening doors and lighting paths and doing all those things. But if we wanted to sit down right in the middle of the road and go, I ain't going no farther, he's not going to make us do it, right? Yeah. So Mary didn't resign herself to being the mother of Jesus just because God sent an angel to speak these things to her. Mary instead accepted God's will and his plan above any that she had for her own life. Next, we're going to go into Joseph. Guess what? No one really talks about Joseph in this whole scenario. But I have to think that God had to have just the right man be involved in these events as he needed just the right woman to be involved in them. Because Mary gets all the credit all the time, right? So much so that sometimes her credit is even given to her um, with the great error of considering her a deity herself even. Mary is not, okay, part of the Godhead. Mary is not deity. Mary is the mother of Jesus, but she was a human, 100% a human. She went on to have relations with her husband. She went on to have other children. She was not a perpetual virgin, okay? And she was at no part of the Godhead whatsoever. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's it. Mary wasn't a part of that. But Mary was blessed, highly favored among all women and used of God, okay? For a great and amazing task. So she gets all this credit even all the way to the side of error, as some religions will do in in thinking um, thinking of her as deity, but not much is ever said about Joseph. Not many kudos or accolades or looks of wonder or admiration are given to him. But shouldn't they be if we really think about it? He's betrothed to a young maiden, to a virgin who ends up pregnant, Betrothed means engaged, means they ain't married yet, they ain't living together yet, they ain't doing nothing yet, okay? And she ends up pregnant. And as if that wasn't enough, in regards to just the heartache and all the swirling thoughts and emotions that would be going on, there was also this whole other aspect of public ridicule to think about as well. This wasn't just them and like subject only to them and they could keep it all quiet, okay? Joseph was presumably, presumably... much older than Mary, okay? He's a Jew. He's likely well-known in the area where they live, but not only in the place that he resided, 
okay, when the news came, but also, guess what? They're traveling back to his hometown, to Bethlehem, because it's the time of the census. And so he's going to take along with him a very pregnant Mary, who is not yet his wife. And Joseph, though he wasn't brought in on the choice of whether Mary would become pregnant, okay? The angel didn't ask his permission, okay? He did, however, have many, many choices to make during all of this, okay? So whether to put her away privately, as Scripture tells us, okay? This is found in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read verse 18 and 19. Matthew says, this is how the birth of Jesus... I cannot read Matthew anymore without thinking of Matthew from The Chosen now. (laughs) He's so precise, and all I can do is picture Matthew from The Chosen. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. (laughs) His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but, listen, before they came together, do I have to, uh, like, explain that at all? No, thank you. She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, it says her husband, okay, but that's because, we'll get into that in a second. They were betrothed to each other. They were engaged, okay? But in those days, once you were betrothed or engaged, it would actually take a letter of divorce, okay, to separate yourself from them. So even though the marriage hadn't happened yet, the marriage isn't consummated yet, none of those things have happened yet still, okay, if you're going to end up not together and not getting married, you would have to get a divorce back then, okay? So here it says, Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, okay? He's a Jew. He's faithful to the law, okay? Guess what the law said should have happened to Mary? Yeah, he should have stoned her to death. So it says, Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, so he had in mind to divorce her quietly. That's what he was going to do. Like, I just heard this news. This is crazy. Whoa. (laughs) Here's a whole different whoa. Okay? And so he has it in his mind to divorce her quietly. And so we see here that he was not at first accepting, not in the least, okay? He didn't want to publicly humiliate her, okay, or risk her to stoning, but he still had no intentions on carrying on with the marriage to her either. But then we read in the next verse, verse 20, and we'll read down through 25. But after he had considered this, considered divorcing her, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will come, or will conceive and bring forth, bring, I cannot read, I'm sorry. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. We just read that song, what does, or sang that song. I can't talk either. What does that mean? What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. Verse 24, listen to this. When Joseph woke up, who ever had a dream that changed our mind right in the middle of the night while we were sleeping? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Verse 25, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and he gave him the name Jesus. So there was a lot. Everybody say a lot. There was a lot of accepting that needed to take place on Joseph's part. And he did do just that. Yet even with the dream, I imagine that there still had to be a little bit of a sting that was attached to all of it, right? So we went through Gabriel and we went through Mary and we went through Joseph. And now we're going to go through Jesus himself, okay? Because guess who else had a choice to make in all of this? Yeah. Who else also exercised acceptance in this whole matter? Jesus did. 
Jesus himself did, right? Jesus is a member of the Godhead, sure, but we see it clearly spelled out for us in another portion of Scripture, okay, that his will and that of God the Father were not always 100% in sync, right? He takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's there, and he says, pray that you don't fall into temptation, and he, withdrew, he withdraws from them. It says just a stone's throw. He wasn't very far away from them. And he withdraws from them, okay? And he gets down on his knees and he's praying. And what does he say to God? Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me or let this cup pass from me, right? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What does that show us? There were two different wills at play right here, right? And then it says an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, okay? But he was still in great anguish, even after being strengthened by the angel. And it says he prayed more earnestly, and the sweat was like great drops of blood that fell to the ground. But think of this, not my will, or nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus' will needed to be sacrificed, and the will of the Father needed to be surrendered to. Okay, and so we need to see that in this whole scene here as well, in this whole plan of redemption for all of mankind, that there were many times other than the cross that Jesus actually sacrificed. He sacrificed his place in heaven to come to earth as a helpless, innocent, newborn baby, right? Paul speaks in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. This is the NIV. He says, who... Being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Like there's death and then there's death on a cross, okay? So he sacrificed his place in heaven to come to earth as a helpless, innocent, newborn baby. And he sacrificed his will in the Garden of Gethsemane when he spoke those words that we just read a moment ago. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And each of these, and I'm sure there's others that I didn't take time to ponder today, okay? They all needed sacrifice before he could even make the biggest sacrifice at all. Or of all, sacrificing his own life, shedding his own blood, surrendering his own will, right? Humbling his own self, all so that the plan of salvation, the redemption of sinful man could be made available for whoever would choose to lay hold of it. So Gabriel, with not a word, but an immediate action to the directive that was given to him, the task he was to perform, the message he was to give, he just went and did it. Joseph, and accepting, which was much more than most men would have been able to stomach, let alone live with. And then Jesus, sacrificing so much, even before sacrificing his life, accepting from the very beginning the plan of redemption that was set in place. It says, from the foundations of the world, the lamb was slain, right? He made that decision from the very beginning. And then Mary, with so many questions and so many scenarios and so many wanderings, not even knowing how Joseph would respond, still she was accepting right from the very beginning. What an example to us, not even knowing how crazy everybody else is going to think that you are, not even knowing whether your future is all going to be an upheaval then, and you don't even know who's going to provide for you if so, and just giving God your yes anyway. If these could be our own responses, let it be to me according to your word. I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. If these would be our responses when God draws us and calls us and leads us whether it's a calling to fulfill or whether it's a cross to bear whether it's a thorn to endure whether it's a city or a livelihood to leave behind whatever it is that God asks of us 
may we be as these examples were tonight and as so many others throughout scripture in accepting Advent, the season of accepting the call and the will of God upon our lives. Because we truly can not even fathom the impact that our yes could have on the kingdom of God. Amen. So if Mercy Music wants to come up to the front. Oh, that is what I have for you this evening. I want us to think of these things. You know, I want to think of us to think of them just as we open scripture, no matter what portion of scripture we're reading.